My name is Craig Kalki from the Lake Ontario Fruit Program. I welcome you to our 2022 statewide pink webinar that we are co-hosting with CCE Eastern New York Commercial Hort Program. So the other specialists that we have on here are Janet Van Zoren, IPM specialist for Lake Ontario Fruit Team, Mario Miranda Sazo, cultural practices, who's in the field, uh, Mike Bastow from Eastern New York, the Champlain Valley region, and Dan Donahue from the Hudson Valley region will be joining us in a minute. So I am about to, a couple other things I wanted to let folks know. Um, this, again, this will be recorded and it's gonna be posted to our YouTube channels, both uh, Lake Ontario Fruit Program and Eastern New York Commercial Hort, Hort Program uh, within a day or two. We know we're not quite at the pink timing for a lot of us in Western New York and in the Champlain Valley, but we wanted to cover it as the Hudson Valley is entering pink and we'll be able to, to do a statewide meeting here. We are going to diverge as the season goes on and the phenology changes for our three different regions. And we plan to have more meetings like this where Terrence can give thin, thinning, recommendation, thinning recommendations via Zoom. And we're also shooting for some field meetings uh, in which we can have pest management questions answered, pest management um, programming, and, and the networking that we all miss from, from about two years now. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and turn the program over to Terrence Robinson, who's going to start us off with precision crop load management. I appreciate this opportunity to launch the thinning effort for 2022, because I think this is a really critical year for many different reasons. And I hope that what I cover today will gear you up for a very successful uh, season producing at the end, the right fruit size. I wanna start with just a review of last year. Last year, we had an off year for Honeycrisp and in Western New York, surprisingly an off year for Ida Red. And there's other varieties likewise impacted, some by frost, but some just because of lack of return bloom. <clears throat> However, this winter, we've had a fairly decent winter without excessively cold temperatures. Uh, from the weather stations that I've gleaned, there was a minus 19 in the Champlain in January. The lowest in Western New York was minus 10 and the lowest in the Hudson Valley at the lab was minus two. So there appears to be very little winter damage and kings appear to be healthy. Although there could be some places where there's some effects from the winter, but I think in overall, it will be very little effect. To me, what I've seen so far bloom in 2022 is generally very high with most blocks. And that's gonna to lead to poor return bloom in 2021 if we don't do significant efforts this year to manage crop load. And that's why I'm so happy to have this uh, webinar this morning, just to get everybody uh, geared up for this effort. <clears throat> we have been promoting and we continue to promote the idea of precision crop load management, trying to get the fruit number to exact an exact pre-calculated number that is the optimum number for optimum economic results. Now, the first step in this effort is to calculate how many fruits the tree should have. Now, this has to be done based upon the expected fruit size and what is the potential yield that that orchard has? The two pictures show a Honeycrisp orchard on the left that's fully developed and has the potential, I believe, to produce 1,200 bushels to the acre. The tree on the right is a gala tree that has the potential to produce 1,500 bushels to the acre or even higher. The way I would calculate the number of fruits in each of those two orchards are given in the examples below. For the 1,200 bushel per acre expected Honeycrisp crop, I would suggest a target of 80 count fruit <clears throat> with a tall spindle spacing of three by 11, that's 1,320 trees to the acre, that results in 73 fruits per tree. I emphasize it was Honeycrisp, we very rarely want more than 100 fruits per tree. If you have more than 100 fruits, often it results in biennial bearing. And I wanna emphasize that with Honeycrisp, the number is relatively low. Now, many of you have a three by 12 spacing, that requires closer to 80 fruits, but still it's below 100. However, with Gala, even we're looking for a higher yield, but it's a smaller fruit variety. So I've put in a target of 100 count fruit per box, still 1,320 trees to the acre. That gives us 114 fruits per tree. In many tall spindle orchards, 
of gala, we're shooting between this 114, 15 and 130 fruits per tree to maximize fruit size and profitability. The second step is through pruning to reduce the number of flower buds to a specific target number. But how many flowering spurs should you have on a gala tree? I show here data from an experiment we did last year in several locations around the US. This has Washington data in blue and New York data in orange. And it shows across the bottom axis how many flowering clusters we left on the tree. We left 50, 100, 150, 200, up to 400. And when we calculated with the help of Miguel Gomez and Mauricio, his postdoc, the economic output or return, we can see that in Washington, they get more money uh, because they can produce larger size on gala than in New York. But the orange line for New York shows that the maximum profitability is achieved somewhere between 250 buds and 300 buds per tree. Now, Gala can often have five or 600 buds per tree, but I want you to remember that number of 250 buds is sort of a target number that we'd like to shoot for with Gala. With Honeycrisp, the curves are slightly different. And I show here both, uh, three locations, Washington, um, New York, and North Carolina. Here, the optimum number is slightly lower than with uh, Gala, where the curve shows we should be leaving between 200 and 215 flowering spurs on tall spindle trees. Uh, <clears throat> in, so far, we've done a lot of counting with my postdoc, Luis, and my technicians in Geneva, and the Honeycrisp trees at Geneva and what we're seeing around the industry are very high this year. Often in 2022, we're looking at four to 500 flowering spurs. We need to be down around 200. <clears throat> now, it's really important that we control the number of buds on the tree through pruning for two reasons. One, the first one I show here is that with excessive number of buds with that little diagram on the right, it shows that the tree mobilizes its reserves of nitrogen, carbohydrates, and cytokinins in the spring, and it distributes those reserves into buds. But when you have excessive number of flower buds, each bud receives less than in the optimum number, resulting in weak buds that have low set. And especially with gala, it gives small fruit size when you have excessive number of buds. And then lastly, weak buds are more biannual with Honeycrisp. But the other reason is this study we did for 18 years every year applying the same doses and the graph is shown on the right. If you start with more flower clusters, you end up with more final fruits, no matter how hard you thin. So the line shows on the X axis, this is with Gala, 250 clusters going all the way up to 1,500 clusters, which is a very heavy blooming Gala. And you can see that if you start with a low number of flower clusters, 250, you still end up with about 500 fruits. And if you start with 1500, you end up with 900 fruits. So even when you thin chemically really aggressively, there's no real way to get that number down. So the best way is to not start with too many buds on either Gala or Honeycrisp. <clears throat> now there's still time for everybody in the state to adjust bud load number through precision pruning. Even if you prune in the winter and took out your big limbs and columnarized remaining branches, this window between green tip and bloom that we're in right now allows you to readjust flower bud number to a target. So I'd suggest you send some people out, you count number of flower clusters, especially on Honeycrisp trees. And if you're way over the 200 number, uh, prune some more off. And I give an example here, really in Honeycrisp, we're looking for 131 flowering spurs on a tall spindle at three by 11. Certainly don't leave more than 250. And on Gala, don't leave more than 300 to try, particularly with Honeycrisp to avoid biannual bearing. <clears throat> <clears throat> now with that already pretty much having been done, I hope people have pruned correctly and they're not leaving too many buds because you'll regret it next spring. But with that having been done, let's move now to what faces us, and that's the chemical thinning uh, process. We're suggesting the strategy of using multiple applications of chemical thinners to reduce the fruit number in a stepwise manner until you reach the target. 
This involves blossom thinning using the pollen tube growth model as a guide to when to apply the sprays. And then after bloom, it involves using the carbohydrate model to guide post bloom thinning. It also involves using the fruit growth rate model to assess how close you are to the target and guiding your application of thinners a second, third, or even fourth time through this period that's coming up. <clears throat> this is a graphic representation of the process. Um, after pruning, we need an assessment of how many flower clusters are on the tree, and then we start thinning. And with pollen tube growth model, I'll talk a little bit more, but here in yellow, I highlight that in contrast to what they're doing in the West, we're suggesting that you spray ATS at 60% on the pollen tube growth model, not 100%. I won't explain all the reasons for that, but an important reason I will suggest now is that ATS is not as good a chemical thinner as lime sulfur that they use in the West. Hence, we need to spray earlier to kill uh, pollen tubes on flowers that we don't want to set. Secondly, at the petal fall timing and 10 millimeter, 12, I call it the 12 millimeter timing now, and on the 16 to 18 millimeter timing, we're suggesting that you time those sprays based on the weather and degree days. Wait to put on the petal fall thinning spray till you reach 110 to 130 degree days after bloom, full bloom. And then wait to put on the 12 millimeter spray until you're in the window between 200 and 250 degree days after bloom. And then wait if you need it to put on this last rescue spray to when you're in the window between 300 and 350 degree days after bloom. Let me focus for a few minutes on blossom thinning. I know that it's difficult to sometimes have the courage to blossom thin, but it's essential for honeycrisp to achieve good return bloom. It's essential, I think, for Fuji also to achieve good return bloom. And it's essential for Gala to achieve good fruit size. We suggest you use a pollen tube growth model to time the sprays. And we thank Greg Peck and the people at NUA for getting this in a very excellent form <clears throat> on the NUA website. I emphasize that the measurement of the style length is a variable that the grower has to input into the model. So you have to physically measure the style length on several flowers to get an average and input that number. The figure on the right shows the proper method to measure style length. You keep the sepals, but you remove the petals. The sepals are the green part on the bottom of the flower cluster. And they're generally flat or pointed down. And you measure from that point upward to the tip of the pistils. If you strip off those uh, <clears throat> sepals, it, some people then measure at the bottom of the pistil and that gives too long of a style length. And that incur then you put that in the model and it tells you to, to spray too late and you don't get any thinning. Now in New York State, we're only allowed to spray ATS. <clears throat> Lime sulfur is not allowed to be sprayed at bloom. That may change in the future, but for the moment, we suggest you use lime sulfur at a rate between two and a half and 3%. Now this is a little bit higher than what I said last year. I've tested it up to three and a half, but I often get too much phytotoxicity at three and a half. So I'm limiting it to 3%. What it does, it burns the stigmatic surface of the pistol it also almost always will cause some mild leaf burning, but we don't see any burning on the fruit itself. <clears throat> if you see leaf burning, leaf phytotoxicity, don't worry. That's just a good sign that you actually got enough chemical on. Generally, you have to spray it twice and in some years, three times. But when using the pollen tube growth model to, to time this spray, it can do a substantial amount of thinning. It doesn't really boost fruit size except for the amount of thinning you get. <clears throat> it's technically not registered as a thinner in New York. So in your pesticide logs, you have to list this as a foliar nitrogen fertilizer, which it is. We've found consistently that it improves return bloom. And we think that's because it reduces the seed load by knocking out seeds on many, many, many flowers that don't set. And then you have a lower seed load. 
That leads me to try to reemphasize a principle I tried to teach last year and I want to reteach this year. Why is bloom thinning so critical for Honeycrisp? There's no place in the world that has conquered the bienniality of Honeycrisp that doesn't use blossom thinning. And that's because this little diagram shows that the seeds on a spur produce gibberellins, and those gibberellins move to the shoot tip, which could become a flower, but they inhibit the formation of the flower. So at bloom, the potential number of seeds, if everyone is fertilized and you didn't do any blossom thinning, gives a huge number of seeds. And the sooner, the earlier in the season that you can reduce those numbers of seeds down to a reasonable number, the more likely you can induce flower initiation with your return bloom sprays that I'll talk about in a moment. Just to illustrate the big difference in seed numbers, I give two examples. In the first example at the bottom, uh, a tree is pruned to 146 initial buds. That's kind of what we would suggest, 130 to 140 initial flower buds. And then we did precision thinning and we got it down to singles on every cluster. That would leave 146 final fruits. That's 10 seeds per fruit, that's 1,460 seeds on that tree. That's the total seed load. But this year, many Honeycrisp trees have 400 initial buds. And if you don't get them pruned off, uh, even if you did thin them all down to a single fruit per cluster, you'd still have 400 fruits on that tree. And then the seed load is 4,000. There's no way that we've discovered to overcome the gibberellin effect of 4,000 seeds on a tree. But blossom thinning <clears throat> combined with precision pruning is an excellent way to remove excess seeds before they inhibit flowering. Now, when we talk about blossom thinning, ATS is not the only option. You can also spray hormone type thinners at bloom. And I list here four possibilities. Now we know the promelin when sprayed for typiness of delicious and gala does give in some warm years thinning. So this year, if you're getting ready to spray gala or delicious with promelin at the early bloom stage and it's warm, you can probably get some thinning out of it. <clears throat> The rate we use for that is the high rate of promelin, that's two pints to the acre. But if you have warm temperatures, you're almost more successful with Maxell at bloom. But it is very dependent on warm temperatures. If you don't have warm temperatures in bloom, it's a waste of money. <clears throat> Over the years, I've seen about one year and three, we get a decent response from Maxell. This case, we're using a high rate of eight pints to the acre. And that's much, much more than what you would get out of promelin. Now, more commonly, we have great success with either NAA or NAD at bloom. NAA has been allowed at bloom for a long time, but NAD only recently has been allowed at bloom. They're both very safe and can be sprayed at relatively high rates at 10 parts per million, which is four ounces to the acre. And they don't really negatively affect the tree photosynthesis at this timing, but they can also help in return bloom with Honeycrisp. And they can also help in reducing fruit number to improve fruit size of gala. Some growers have had great luck in the last few years with Amethyn. It can be sprayed safely at a high rate of eight ounces per hundred, which would be about 16 ounces per acre. And it is very, very good product. I like them both for this bloom timing. When would you use ATS versus a hormone type thinner? Over the years, my experience is that ATS has done better at return bloom than NAA for strongly biennial varieties. So I suggest growers use ATS for Honeycrisp, Fuji, Evercrisp, which is showing some challenges, a good set, yearly good set, and Red Delicious. However, for the other varieties that are not so biannual, uh, small fruited, the hormone thinners also work really well. That's not to say you couldn't use ATS on Gala. You certainly can. Uh, it's a little more tricky in the timing, but the hormone thinners will work quite well with Gala with less precision on the timing. Now the ATS has to be sprayed when the pollen tube growth model indicates 60%. You have to start the model when enough flowers are open for a full crop, 
enough kings are open for your 100 or 120 flower or fruits and then spray pretty close to the time when that temperature moves the model to 60%. However, with a hormone type thinners, it doesn't really matter. You generally can spray at 80% bloom or even 100% bloom and get the same results from the hormone type thinners. So what we suggest is that you spray the hormone thinners at 80%. That's when eight flowers out of 10 are open or four out of five in every cluster. Two cautions, in years when we have frost or slow drying in wet conditions, the caustic thinners are more risky, especially if there's frost. If there's frost, I would suggest you not spray the ATS, you just spray the, one of the hormone type thinners because the frost damages the fruit skin and the caustic thinners then can cause russety. Now I'd like to move to post bloom chemical thinning. We still have some time for this and we're gonna have more um, thinning webinars between now and then. And so my main goal today was to cover flower blossom thinning to encourage you to do that. But as we move forward and we get to petal fall, I wanna emphasize a couple of things. We spray the petal fall spray at 110 to 130 degree days. That coincides with fruit sizes of five to six millimeters. Often, People <clears throat> move their bees out and put on their petal fall insecticide when fruitlets are only four millimeters. Over the years, when we sprayed at four millimeters, we get almost no thinning. But by waiting just a couple of days till the fruits get to five to six, we can sometimes, or not sometimes, always we get much better thinning. So that's why we want to time the petal fall thinning spray possibly different than the petal fall insecticide and fungicide spray. We also time the 12 millimeter spray at 200 and 250 degree days, and then the rescue spray at 300 and 350, as I said earlier. <clears throat> so let me repeat some of what I said. We want to spray the petal fall spray a little bit after the insecticide petal fall spray when fruits are five to six millimeters. Time it based on degree days that you can get from the Malusim carbohydrate model. There's several options, seven, Amethin is great, Maxellin 7 in some cases, NA and 7, Maxellin NA, and in the future, Metametron, but it's not yet labeled. My preference is NA and 7. Later, when we get to the 12 millimeter stage, there my preference is Maxellin 7, but at that moment in time, almost every thinner needs carbaryl put with it. Now, I listed here a new option, called ACCEED, it's ACC. It has received a registration in New York and nationally, but the company Valent is rolling it out in a unique way. They're not selling it this year openly. They will possibly allow you to have buy some product for you to try, but they wanna roll it out in a more measured manner so that we don't start on the wrong foot with this new chemical thinner. I didn't list the combination, but in reality, I think Exceed needs to be combined with Maxell or needs to be combined with Seven. If you want to have a, a carbaryl free program and you don't want to spray Seven, then Maxell and Exceed is an option that we've had very good luck with at Geneva. <clears throat> Lastly, <clears throat> at the larger fruit size, the best thing that has worked for us so far is Maxell Seven and oil. <clears throat> However, Exceed also works at large fruit sizes, 18 to 20 millimeters, and works best when either combined with Maxell in a carbaryl free program. But the new product that's not yet labeled Metametron is a powerful thinner at this timing, and in the future, that will be another great tool to have in our toolbox. So let me suggest a, a couple of things for Honeycrisp and Gala as you think about moving forward with a program. For Honeycrisp, I like to start with ammonium thiosulfate, two and a half to 3%. I wanna pause here and just emphasize that no matter how much water you're spraying in the concentration in the tank shouldn't be greater than two and a half to 3%. That means that at every hundred gallons in your tank, there's two and a half or three gallons of ATS. So on a 500 gallon sprayer, you're never gonna have more than 15 gallons of ATS in it. If you use the concentrate factor that we use for most chemical thinners, you'll have way higher concentration and much greater 
tissue burn. Epilophol for Honeycrisp, I like the NA and seven, a quite high dose. And then at 10 or 12 millimeters, uh, NA and seven again, but with a slightly lower dose of NA of three ounces, which is seven and a half parts per million. And if we need additional thinning, then I like Maxell and seven and oil at the 15 to 20 millimeter stage. With Gala, it's a very similar thing, but at Bloom, I suggest just NAA or Amethyn. And then at Petalfall and NAA and seven, but then a very strong Maxell program at 12 millimeters of essentially a gallon to the acre plus a pint of seven. If you have to come back because that thinner spray didn't work, then another gallon of Maxell and a pint of seven and a pint of oil or the new thinner exceed in Maxell will work. And so that's available this year, but you have to talk to valent representatives and let them walk you through how to use it. I wanted to make a few comments about the carbohydrate model. It's available and essential in pre precision thinning to determine how much chemical to put in the tank on the day you spray. There's a mobile phone version and the Malusim app we have a new version that's still not available, but should be in about a week. I'll send out a note when it is available that has a few minor corrections for 2022. So don't use last year's mobile phone version. Just wait till you get the, letter, the note from me through the extension newsletters, then just download the new version of Malusim. That uh, model gives us both recommendations for when to thin, but also it gives us this degree day um, number that we can use to time our sprays. This is a picture of the output showing on the column, first blue column, the daily carbohydrate balance. And then next to that, the seven day average carbohydrate balance. But in the next to the last column, it gives you degree days. And in the last column, it gives you a recommendation in words, what to say. Now I wanna emphasize that these columns that are in blue right now will color differently based upon what we expect the thinning efficacy to be. Turns out that these days on in uh, 2021, we would have expected very mild thinning because the carbohydrate balance is positive. And hence the recommendation would be to put on even more than the normal rate because the L means there's low risk of over thinning. This is a graph showing in the Champlain Valley how the carbohydrate balance changed through last season at bloom. It was positive, the big negative dip right around petal fall. And then when we got to 12 millimeters, it was positive. I show here in the bottom that same output from the carbohydrate model starting on May 26th when the Champlain Valley achieved 200 degree days from bloom. And that box has now got a black circle around it. And for between 200 and 250, are the days to spray for the 12 millimeter spray. And you can see in the Champlain Valley, they had essentially six days to choose from. But during that window, as the chart in the top shows, it was a positive surplus of carbohydrate. Hence, the recommendation here on the right was, even though it was the optimum timing, you still had to increase your rates because the thinning <clears throat> efficacy was expected to be low. Let me end with just this uh, plea that the only real way to do precision thinning is to know how much you thinned off at each application. And so we really encourage you to measure fruit diameters. And the standard way we suggest is you select five trees and you count the total number of flower clusters on each of five trees, but do not count flower cl clusters on one year wood. Then tag 15 of those spurs and measure their diameter 50 degree days after the application that you're interested in. So it'd be 50 degree days after a petal fall, or if it was a 12 millimeter, 50 degree days after that. And then remeasure at 100 degree days after that application and use the Malusim version of this carbohydrate or this uh, fruit growth rate model. It's either on the phone app or at malusim.org that you go to with your computer. I show here what it looks like on the carbohydrate model Let's suppose that in this particular case, the grower sprayed it exactly 200 days after bloom, his 12 millimeter spray. He would then wait until he got to 250, which would be either one, two, three, four, five, or six days after, because it was cool. We had no really warm temperatures that time. But this allows you to 
measure 50 degree days after, and then wait till 100 degree days have accumulated for your second measurement with the fruit growth rate model. Now there are issues with this fruit growth rate model. People don't like it because it's time consuming and tedious to measure by hand 375 fruitless two times between each spray. I think it's essential and I encourage every grower to do this to be able to guide their thinning actions. The other problem is I find repeatedly errors in the coding in the spreadsheet and that gives inaccurate assessments of thinning. Now we have incorporated error detection protocols in the new version that you can download on um, ValueSim, and so that's why I encourage you to use it. Now, we're pretty excited that there are three possible solutions to this that are coming along. One is using cell phones to take pictures of fruitlets and then have a company measure their diameters automatically for you and calculate drop. Both Fruit Scout and Farm Vision are offering this as a service this year, and I encourage you to contact them if you're interested to have this method of using the fruit growth rate model. Another method we're not releasing yet this year, but in the next issue of the Fruit Quarter, you'll see an article <clears throat> that shows a method of calculating diameters by just picking 200 fruits out there. And the third option is using a, a light reflectance uh, meter to possibly identify how many fruits are falling. I think I'll skip those two charts. Yeah, just let you know we're almost out of time, Terrence. And just end with my summary slide for my tips for successful thinning in 2022. I think you still have to assess each block. So far, we haven't had frost issues, but we're not out of the woods yet. If we have frost and you're missing the king flower, you still should thin because the laterals can make a huge crop. But if all the kings are present, this year is a year that you're gonna to have to really be aggressive in thinning. But follow what the carbohydrate model says. If on the day you spray, it says increase rates, increase your rates. But if on the day you spray, it says reduce rates, you better reduce it. I want you to time your sprays based on the degree day calculator in the carbohydrate model. And I've already gone through those three different windows of degree days. Lastly, I want to suggest a couple of practical things. I suggest you nozzle your sprayer differently for each spray. For the blossom spray, especially with ATS, now not so much with the hormone thinners, but with ATS, you have to have uniform nozzles from top to the bottom of the sprayer because you're trying to coat the stigma of each flower with a constant concentration and amount of ATS. So in this case, we don't direct two thirds of the spray to the top of the tree. Every part of the tree gets the same amount of spray. But once we move into the hormone sprays, petal fall, 12 millimeter and 18, we nozzle the sprayer differently at the top half versus the bottom half. For the petal fall spray, I like the traditional <clears throat> one third of the spray going to the bottom half of the tree and two thirds to the top. But for the latter sprays, I like even more of the spray directed towards the top 75% at the 12 millimeter and at the 18 millimeter, only the top of the tree. <clears throat> Lastly, a comment about surfactants. Now Regulate does increase the response of NA, not so much with Maxell, but certainly with NA. If there's no carbohydrate deficit, Regulate is a good thing to include. It helps increase the response. But if you're looking at carbohydrate deficit and then you put Regulate in with it, you'll get over thinning. Oil is also a surfactant but we only use oil when we get to that desperation stage for the rescue spray at 18 millimeters. <clears throat> I think I'll skip some of this and just end with this slide. Return bloom of Honeycrisp requires a real effort. And this is the program we're suggesting this year. Spray with ATS, then spray with two sprays of NA and get your thinning done. That petal fall on 12 millimeters. But then we're suggesting you start with a series of ethereal sprays earlier than what we've previously suggested. The first one at 16 millimeters at half rate, that's half pint per acre. But then three more every week after that at a full pint of ethereal per acre. If you did a good job of pruning and then a good job of bloom thinning and petal fall on 12 millimeters and you can get the seed number down to a reasonable number, which is, you know, maybe um, 1,000 to 1,500 seeds per tree, that's 100 to 150 fruits per tree, then these return bloom sprays will work. But if not, 
then they still won't work. But nevertheless, I'll end there. Thank you for your attention. And I hope we can meet again for a successful thinning season this year. Thank you very much, Terrence. There <clears throat> are some questions in the Q&A box. If you could work on those, it'd be greatly appreciated. I'm gonna turn it over to Dan Donahue from Eastern New York, who's gonna give a lightning talk <clears throat> uh, using ProHex Calcium to help mitigate, mitigate bitter pit. And Dan, you should be able to raise, yep, sharing your screen. Yep, looks good, Dan. Okay, let me go to full screen. There we go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. This is a lightning talk, very uncharacteristic for me, as you know, but we'll try to keep it to five or six minutes and just get to the basics here on um, early season honey crisp bitter pit mitigation. Okay, just a reminder that bitter pit mitigation or reduction in honey crisp is complicated. Like this football play here, there are many moving parts and we need to use them in an integrated fashion in order to reduce this, uh, this real scourge. And I'll tell you what, in 2021, in our 20 reference blocks we've been following since 2016, we averaged 31% bitter pit out of storage. So it, it really is a nightmare disorder for profitability in this variety, okay? And I, I can't resist putting this quote in from Henry Ford. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. I think that's brilliant, I love it. All right, let's start with um, the integrated program and some important points that I wanna just review here. One is manage your crop load to maintain an annual bearing habit. And again, using Terrence's recommendations, this is critical. We know that if you go into a biennial mode in the light year, besides not having much of a crop, you will be hammered with bitter pit and I don't think there's much you can do about it. In the heavy year, you might have, you will have less bitter pit, but of course your other quality factors such as flavor and color will suffer. So really your first mission is to stay on an annual bearing habit. All right, nitrogen, only use the amount necessary to maintain good tree health and adequate terminal growth. Our successful honey crisp blocks in the Hudson Valley average about 11 inches of terminal shoot growth uh, a year. So manage your nitrogen closely. Uh, reduce potassium, you know, work done by Lei Leng <coughs> Cheng and Mario Miranda Sazo, you know, indicate that uh, honey crisp does not require as much potassium. Uh, consider this also in a light crop year where you don't have to necessarily use as much potassium. And again, maintain your soil pH around seven. So that may in older blocks, uh, some maintenance uh, dolomite applications in order to maintain that. Okay, when it comes to apogee or prohexadione calcium at pink, and kudos is a formulation of prohexadione calcium that I want to see you use six ounces per acre at true full pink. And if you do, in most of the time, at least it will significantly reduce bitter pit incidence. Secondly, Apogee when used post petal fall can significantly increase bitter pit incidence. And I know this is counterintuitive because everybody thinks that reducing terminal shoot growth reduces could lead to reduced competition, reduce bitter pit. Myself, I don't believe that that is correct. I've looked into this and I have not found any proof of that. Um, so you can't prove a negative. So, so who knows in a crazy situation where you have 24 inches of terminal shoot growth, but again, if you're managing your nitrogen successfully and terminal shoot growth is moderate, like we experienced certainly in the Valley, um, we don't, we shouldn't use Apogee post bloom. So timing and rate are significant factors. I know the label was changed to a three ounces per hundred, but as Terrence suggests, when PGRs come to mind, tall spindles are tree row volume of 200, which works out to be six ounces per acre of apogee. All right, to make things go a little easier, B9 blocks simply produce fruit with less bitter pit. So I would not bother applying this program applying Apogee at pink to B9 blocks. One, I don't think it's really necessary. Two, B9 honey crisp is a very slow, can be a very slow growing uh, combination. And 
even a single pink application of, of ProHex can be about 30% effective uh, in reducing shoot growth. So we don't need to do that in B9. So I would skip your B9 blocks. Also don't apply it to young blocks because again, you want them to fill out the trellis and you'll sim simply have to use other techniques to manage and reduce bitter pit, including a, a full calcium program. Um, and of course, uh, as Carrick Cox has shown us, pink applications of, of ProHex does uh, help fight off fire blight infections. Okay, so like everything in managing an apple crop, we have a balance here of uh, what's important to you. If you have a Honeycrisp block that has also a fire blight problem, <clears throat> then by all means, use ProHex post bloom. But if you don't, then consider the ramifications on bitter pit of post bloom uh, ProHex applications. Okay, let's integrate foliar calcium into the discussion. And, and that's always a hot topic. Uh, you know, looking at the work that, that I've done in my group since 2016, uh, basically in four replicated trials and one demo type trial, you know, we saw real value in using calcium uh, foliar applications. In two trials, uh, we did not. And I think this jives with some, um, you know, published uh, information and extension information we've seen uh, over the years. It works in most years, but not always. But what I recommend is starting your calcium applications at petal fall and use weekly timing, five weekly applications to, uh, to kind of concentrate the calcium during the cell mitosis period of fruit development. Should you start earlier than that? Sure, why not? I don't have any data on that, but it can only help. And maybe you can think of it like we think of um, Manzate or EBDC use uh, for early scab control in an orchard. You know, you put on those early sprays and you feel maybe they're not needed. However, they do build up material in the orchard uh, that's effective later on. This may be the case here with using calcium early. However, don't add a calcium product to your pink ProHex tank mix because you can't do that. You'll deactivate the, the ProHex or the, the kudos or the Apogee unless it's AgroCase system cal. Uh, this product has been proven in replicated studies to be uh, compatible with ProHex in that tank mix. Uh, if you wish to continue your calcium applications, I would go on a two week, then go to a two week interval uh, into August. And we got to throw some data up there. So I have two slides. I haven't talked about these trials much in my presentations over the last few years, uh, but growers are, of course, are always interested in well, you know, commercial style air blast trials. Uh, so these are, I'm gonna show you data from two trials uh, done a few years ago and where we, these are commercial size, uh, grower applied replicated uh, trials where we looked at Apogee, we looked at thinning timings and we looked at some early calcium. So because of the size of the trials, we don't have all the combinations we would like to have. But what I'd like to point out here is in the far right, um, we have the control at 12 millimeter, no calcium, and we had bitter pit incidence out of storage of over 60%. And you can see in the far, in the far right, our control with summer calcium sprays and a 12 millimeter thinning program, we did get a reduction, a significant reduction in bitter pit. Also, when you look at that control at about 62% bitter pit, you can see that the three Apogee uh, applications in combination with early calcium as you would do it in, in the real world. And all of them showed a reduction in bitter pit. So just to help give you a little bit more confidence in the program. And here's a, a second trial, this one in Columbia County. Uh, and what we see here again in the control, we are up about 35% bitter pit incidence and our three uh, Apogee applications at different thinning timings, all of them significantly reduced a bitter pit. And you're gonna note that there's a thinning timing effect and we won't go into that, that's really complicated, but I've seen that, I have a lot of data on that and maybe someday in the future we'll discuss that. And that wraps things up for my lightning talk and hopefully it was quick enough. And if you have any questions, please put them into the chat box. I'd be happy to address them. Thank you.
All right, great. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, if you do have any questions, we're going to keep rolling, but do put those into the Q&A um, bar down at the bottom there. So we are now going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to move over to talking about pest management, but I have a feeling that we're going to continue to talk about Apogee or ProHex a little bit. So we're going to turn the mic over now to Carrick if you want to um, start sharing and unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. It says unable to start video, but maybe we don't need the video. Um, I yeah, will just try what's sharing. Happening with the videos today. That's it's fine. It's not working. Sorry about that. Nope, not a problem. Um, <laughs> I guess if they want to see me in person, we'll have to do something at Petal Fall. All right. Um, exactly. Let's, uh, let's hit that full sharing mode. Well, look at that craziness. All right, here we go. Let's talk about the old pink update. See where we are with diseases. Okay, apple scab. Um, yep, looks like it's been another fairly mild winter. There's been plenty of warm weather from November to early January. We had some cold weather in February, but it's just, just kind of a ton of warm days. Kind of one of those nice brown winters. Um, started getting green tip maybe end of March, depending on where you live, beginning of April. Um, still a lot of cold days, but you get these really short bouts of really hot weather and then it goes back to very cold but you know as terence mentioned not a lot of spring freezes so far um keep your fingers crossed eh, it seems like a slow start but now it's starting to kick off again and i suspect it'll progress more steadily unless we continue to have cold weather uh i didn't really feel like there's a lot of snow cover this year a lot of rain at green tip and made you know the situation for doing your early season urea get rid of this and your copper to get rid of overwintering and buds for apple scab. Isn't that really gross looking uh, pseudothesium right there? And it's sort of challenging. It's been really wet. I was on the sprayer just before coming to this meeting and it was quite challenging to uh, drive anywhere in the orchards, at least in the middle of the state. Um, so what else about apple scab? It looks like sort of looking around the different places, looking south and looking east. There's a couple possibilities for ejection but in many instances the temperatures were just not warm enough or the leaf wetness was not long enough to allow for infection um, but the two best events thus far happened around 414 and 426 in the south and then the east and depending on where you actually were you might not have had an infection at those events i checked a bunch of different sites and i'll show you some scenarios of how this sort of played out at different locations um you know no locations identified but different ones that i've seen uh north and west that 414 uh, you know most likely wasn't an infection um the maturity just wasn't there and the injection was really low and then again it was really kind of cold for a big infection as we move into the uh 426 which just happened this week around tuesday a couple different scenarios showed up either maturity was still really low or injection was still really low or but there was still plenty of leaf wetness however or the other option was it was just too cold or the leaf wetness was too brief and um uh, and so hopefully we'll avoid some of that. And what these things tend to look like is this, is we're going back to the east and the south. Sometimes I would look on that 414 day, like, oh, okay, big ejection, great. And then I'd come down here like, oh, oh, not enough leaf wetness. And those of you running uh, RIMPRO probably also noticed as well, a lot of ejection and spore germination, but never the big rim infection lines. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. And this sort of is similarly mirrored in the newest system. Sometimes, on 426, if you're in the east and the south, you actually got something that came through, all the uh, pieces aligned with a big ejection event and uh, barely enough leaf wetness and temperature to make it happen. Um, so in many instances, this could possibly be your first real one. Um, so many RIMPRO sites are still saying, no, just didn't, got some ejection, just not enough leaf wetness, depending on where you were and how you wanted to roll with that. Back to the west and the north, um, this is the scenario we often saw, like, oh, here we go. Um, big, oh yeah, look at that big leaf wetness event. Ah, just a lot of really low level um, maturity. Yes, one less than 1% of billions of spores is something, but by then everyone was probably able to put on their silver tip and green tip or even half inch green applications. And we still sort of recommended to watch out for that because it's kind of a scary event. But this season with these sort of shifts in high and low is doing a lot of really weird things with the models. Um, and the other thing that you can run into is this one again. Oh, look at that massive ejection. Oh, we just didn't have enough leaf wetness at the temperature or it was just too interrupted. 
the, what ended up happening is there was a big warm spell and it just came through with a thunderstorm. And depending on where you were in the state, you got a bunch of rain, like in the Finger Lakes and had a real dejection. But sometimes you just didn't get it all because it was kind of pop up due to that rapid change in weather we had from 80 to uh, now 30 and 40 outside. Uh, lots of fun. Uh, what else? Let's talk about fire blight. Um, we're getting ready to move into that weather. March and April's cold. I got these bouts of warm weather. Kind of makes me worried as we go into bloom. We're going to have a really big cold year with these little spikes of really hot temperature. And if so, you'll be wondering, did the fire blight have enough time to grow and do the deed? Um, and we won't know, but we'll probably want to manage it. Right now, I think if you want to see some real flowers, you're going to have to try some early varieties in Hudson Valley or Long Island. Um, they could be in King Bloom, but I think everywhere else is pink. In Geneva, I only have pink on uh, really early varieties um, for the most part. I mean, you know, we could, we, we're probably going to hit it. Everything's still really cold. I wonder if we're going to have a really cool bloom. Right now, your forecast for fire blight looks like this. Even if I run Mary Blight or EIP infection value, as we call it, NUA, out to the future with the extended forecast, I'm just seeing a bunch of green, um, which is good. Maybe we'll have a low fire blight season. Um, so what else? It could be another cold, prolonged bloom. Make for an easy fire blight season. But I'm worried about this. Last time at the Winter Fruit School, we had a little panel, and I've noticed that every year we get these cold blooms, and right at the end of petal, start of petal fall to the end of petal fall, with a little rat tail, we get this hot, stormy weather, that kills off all my Evercrisps um, or any of the other plots in uh, my block, and maybe yours. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, you have, should have opportunities, if it stays cool, to do your um, Pro Hex at Pink. It can help a lot with fire blight. Um, I use this in many cases instead of the post petal fall one, and it seems to do just fine. And then focus on managing the ooze post petal fall. Um, you know, Dan mentioned it's an opportunity for bitter pit. Seems to help sort of thicken this stuff up right here, so that if you do get an infection, it just can't go very far. That's sort of the idea behind all that. Um, you know, depending on what your volume, I usually like the six ounce rate. It sounds like that showed up in Dan's lightning. Um, but if you're going fifty. As we learned, uh, they do want you to correct your ProHex um, rate for um, a tree row volume, according to the label. And you can even drop it even a little lower and drop in a little of this ActiGuard, which also seems to help with the defenses. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and let us get on to Monique. I'll stop the share. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. Um, that brought us a little, um, a little bit closer to on time, but continue. If you have any questions for Carrick, just put those in the Q&A. And then if we have time at the end, we might do some um, unmuting and question asking. But that looks great, Monique. And you can go ahead. Okay, guys. So this is my first pink talk. So I'm going to try to catch us up on time because I tend to talk a little faster. So let's head right into it. We're going to talk about a handful of different insects today. Um, but we're going to have most of the talk on the San Jose scale. So this is an important thing to pay attention to because it can escalate really quickly. So the goal here is to prevent the establishment of the sessile armored stage, which you see in the bottom right. Um, it looks almost like a shell. And there's really three key points for interrupting the life cycle. So the dormant stage, you want to eliminate the population during full inactivity. Um, and that's usually uh, done during dormancy with an oil spray. Um, and and there's the immature crawler stage. So this is their most exposed stage and you have the most insecticide efficacy. So if you can catch this, it's ideal for breaking up those generations. Um, mating, um, basically they're going to come out and you're gonna have the wing forms and that mating is really gonna drive the population growth. So each female can basically have up to 400 young produce. And so that can escalate this really quickly and it can get out of control fast. So it's important to start thinking about monitoring now for the crawlers to go ahead and disrupt that life cycle. So the goal is really to detect this first emergence of crawlers, which you see on the bottom right, they're like these little yellow blobs. So to do this, you wanna scout areas with a history of scale infestation or where you know that there are active scale populations and use black electrical tape around the infested tree limb. So I would take a look at these twice a week for detection and use a 10x hand lens. So once you start seeing them significantly popping out, um, the ideal softest treatment uh, is occurs during dormant, which we've missed for most of the state. Um, 
and this is an oil 2% and you're targeting those black cap dormant stages. Um, you could use an IGR also at this point, such as a steam. Um, so once you they are out and about and you see the crawler stage, uh, you're looking at a couple um, actives that will target specifically piercing sucking insects, so Savanto and Mavento, and then our IGRs, Esteem and Centaur. So right now mating disruption is in development for San, or San Jose scale. So it's important to just keep this in mind and to start to monitor now. So quickly running through some other insects, so a bleak banded leaf roller, we're really looking for the larval stage. Um, and what you are doing here is examining bud clusters. And when do you get to Let's say you are doing 100 of that 100 clusters and you have three infested. This is your treatment point. Um, and the suggestions are mostly, are, are particularly BT products. So Dipel, Agree, Javelin, and others that exist if there's some non um, brand name ones. So Rosie Apple Aphid, another one that can escalate quite quickly. In the top photo, it's a comparison to the green apple aphid, and the rosy is on the right. So they are that pinkish color, which you can see below on the leaf. Um, and so what you want to do here is examine clusters or terminal leaves for wingless adults and nymphs. Once you find one cluster, it's important to go ahead and activate uh, a treatment for this. They can escalate quickly. Um, treatment suggestions would be a dormant oil to try to uh, tackle the egg stage, which we're past that. But Mavento, Savanto, Assail are other options. So tarnished plant bug, these can be annoying if you have an infestation of them. So I would advise, uh, you know, taking these seriously if you do find them because they can cause possible aborted fruit, especially feeding during this early stage during pink. Um, they can have up to two to three generations per year and they're really mostly active um, in the early season on those warmer days. So like we had last weekend. Um, so you wanna start monitoring for these. If you know you have an infestation, you've had uh, damage in the past. White sticky panel traps along the border, uh, which you would have set at silver tip, uh, one trap every three to five acres. And when you're looking at the cumulative trap averages and the related action thresholds, um, three tarnished plant bugs over five traps is a conservative action threshold. Um, and you can use this up to bloom, especially if there's a history of outbreak of these in the field. So five to eight tarnished plant bugs per five traps is a pretty high population, and this is typically used post bloom. Um, but you can stick with a conservative one if you have a history of having trouble with these. So unfortunately, the only real products that work for this are our pyrethroids, um, but be careful about flaring European red mite while using those. Now let's talk a little bit about OFM and CM mating disruption. So there's a lot of um, attention on this uh, because there's a lot of new products coming to market. Um, but now is a good time to hang ties if you're thinking about doing this. The technology is indeed becoming easier to use. Um, for example, I'm specifically talking about the OFM CM mating disruption because combinations of pests are definitely improving things. Um, and less dispensers per acre. That's great because it's reduced amount of labor. So for example, Sidetrack, which is a Trace product, their CM OFM Miso is only 32 dispensers per acre, which is great. So this technique is best for larger blocks. And we still have some questions that we need to answer about this. So for example, what does a spray program look like while initiating this? Um, I would suggest if you have any interest at all um, in this to go ahead and start playing around with it. We are trying to answer this uh, question in the Champlain Valley, starting to look at uh, what this looks like with an overlay of a spray program. And then also dispersal of the pheromone under varying conditions. So those puffers are pretty commonly used on the West Coast, but um, you know it's not abundantly clear how the pheromone is emitted over time or how it stays in the air here where we have much higher humidity and different temperature conditions. So with that, that is my last slide and put any questions in the chat box. I think I did okay at catching us up. I wanna thank everybody for attending and we look forward to more of these in the future. And we also look forward to seeing you all out in the field. Thanks and have a great day.